Welcome to Beyond Your Why podcast, where we go beyond just talking about your why and actually help you discover and then live your why. You see, we believe that knowing your why, that driving force behind every decision you make and every action you take is the essential first step to really knowing yourself. It allows you to move forward faster and have a bigger impact. If you're already a fan of the show, then you know that every week we talk about one of the nine whys, and then we introduce you to somebody with that why so you can see how their why has played out in their life. This show will be more powerful for you if you've already discovered your why. If you still need to do that, head over to whyinstitute.com and discover your why today. It'll only take you about five minutes. Now let's meet today's guest. And so today we're going to be talking about the why of better way to find a better way and share it. So if this is your why, you are the ultimate innovator and you are constantly seeking better ways to do everything. You find yourself wanting to improve virtually anything by finding a way to make it better. You also desire to share your improvement with the world. You constantly ask yourself questions like, what if we tried this differently? What if we did this another way? How can we make this better? You contribute to the world with better processes and systems while operating under the motto, I'm often pleased but never satisfied. You are excellent at associating, which means that you are adept at taking ideas or systems from one industry or discipline and applying them to another with the ultimate goal of improving things. And so today I have a great guest for you. I have been looking forward to this for a while now. (laughs) This is a revisit of somebody that I had on the podcast Gosh, a couple of years back. And since then, a lot of crazy things have happened with him. He's accomplished a lot of things. And we're going to talk about that. But let me tell you his bio first. His name is Chris Smith. He is a former Navy SEAL with decades of experience in the SEAL teams and other special missions operations. He's the CEO and co-founder of Trident Mindset, an online mental toughness training course. He's the founder and co-owner of Trident Athletics, formerly Trident CrossFit, one of the largest CrossFit gyms in the country. Chris is an entrepreneur, extreme adventure athlete, husband, family man, and dog lover. He says it's not just about becoming a SEAL, but also about the journey once we leave the SEAL teams. Chris believes that the psychology of sport, fitness, and fun play a vital role in the success of a healthy lifestyle. His mission is to help others overcome self-doubt and perceived limitations by developing the mental toughness to unleash their warrior within and solve their happiness equation. Now a competitive ultra endurance athlete, he recently completed the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge, a 3000 mile rowboat race across (laughs) the Atlantic Ocean. He was also part of team Shut Up and Row, the fastest American team ever that beat the previous record by 14 days. They finished the race in 33 days, 17 hours and 38 minutes. And you didn't have this, Chris, on your (laughs) your bio, but I'm gonna add this too. You were also part of the world's toughest race that you can see on prime time on prime uh, television. So Chris, welcome to the podcast. Gary, it is so good to see you again. It's been way too long since we've talked, man. Just way too long. Yeah. (laughs) And you and you've done a lot of stuff, man. So <laughs> I was following you on a line when I, you know, when I saw that you were rowing and let, let's talk about that. So, so for those of you yeah. that haven't listened yet to Chris's first podcast interview, please go back and listen to it. Cause you're going to hear the fascinating and mind blowing story of how Chris went from a, a businessman or a engineer, right. To engineer. Yeah. Join- joining the uh, Navy, becoming a SEAL, and then everything that happened to you after that. It's a its yeah. a fascinating story. You actually went through it twice, right? Yeah, so I went through Hell Week twice, yeah. A little bit of skinny guy, hyped out all the good stuff, but made it through, uh, went up to a special missions unit, graduated from that, worked that for a little while, back in the civilian sector, just trying to change lives and make the world a better place. You know, that's my mission. It's, okay, so let's jump into... Um, hopefully you'll go back and listen to that, yep. to, to his interview. But since then, then you, I think during that interview, you couldn't talk about what you were doing. Is that right? I, I kind of remember you true. were in the race or something and you couldn't talk about it because it hadn't aired yet. Yeah, I yeah. think back then I was, we were reasonably sequestered. I think that might be the right word for uh, the world's toughest race, Echo Challenge Fiji. 
So it was a race on what was Discovery Channel. It was a race on primetime TV. Uh, Bear Grylls kind of put it on for us. Um, I raced with a team called Team Onyx that time, which was the first ever all African American team to ever race an adventure race. It was a uh, 11 day adventure race in Fiji, and it was absolutely incredible. Like mm -hmm. most things in life, things just don't go as planned. So you have all the ups and downs that came with that as well. But yeah, last time we chatted, I wasn't able to discover that. But now the show's been aired for a little while. Um, team did okay, had some challenges, but. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that if you want to. And yeah, so then I just, yeah, great. So tell yeah. what, how long was the race? What was yeah. the race? What were the events in the race? Because I was blown away by what you guys had to do. And I was blown away by what it looked like the toughest one was. But tell yeah. them a little bit about this race. Yeah. So if you're unfamiliar with adventure racing, adventure racing is an amalgamation or accumulation of a lot of different sports. Sports like running, trekking, Rucking, mountain biking, kayaking, canoeing, rope climbing, descending, rappelling, like all these different things. What made Fiji really exciting, probably a good word, exciting <laughs> is we use a lot of native Fijian craft. So the race started with uh, a native Fijian outrigger sailboat, which is <laughs> like a canoe with one outrigger on the right side and a a sail made of canvas, basically. So um, local tribe made all the boats for the race. There were, I can't remember now, but maybe 50, 60 boats in the race. So the race started with that. Um, another exciting event there was called a, a Billy Billy. So a Billy Billy is, imagine a stand-up paddleboard that is made of bamboo and uses a bamboo stick for an oar. So we had 70, 80 miles to go up river on a Billy Billy. And that was, uh, <laughs> needless to say, <laughs> long and exciting. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, long and exciting. Yeah. You know, so. what was amazing to me, Chris, was how far each race was. This, this was not like jumping in a little you know, outrigger and going a couple of miles, which to the right. average person would be mind boggling to go that far. Your race, well, how far was the first event? Uh, the first event was the, it was a beautiful day. Everybody's got online. The sailboats are going out and it was supposed to be maybe 50 miles. <laughs> Remember I said native Fijian outrigger sail. <laughs> of course there was zero wind. <laughs> yeah. so it just turned into basically a, a, a paddle, a canoe paddle. So that first event took us 12 hours to get to the other island just to put things in context, it took my team, which is a beginner team, newer athletes, which was part of the our our mission for that race is to bring the sport of adventure racing to minorities or people that don't usually do adventure racing. Teams that do really well, we'll say the the number one team that finished the race was a team from New Zealand who just crushed these events all the time. They finished that thing in like six hours. So, <laughs> so it took us a twelve hour paddle. Took them six hour paddle, and that but led into yeah. Imagine for the listeners what it's like to paddle for 12 freaking hours. I mean, yeah. that just doesn't even seem a fun, but be <laughs> doable in any way. Dude, that's just the first leg. This is yeah. an 11 day race. That's just the first leg you're paddling for 12 hours, jump off the boat, do like an eight or a 10 hour trek around an island, back in the canoe for another 12 hour paddle back. Welcome to day one. <laughs> mind boggling that yeah if you watch it on tv that well that's what was going through my head as i was watching it uh a you got a lot of airtime, which was great yeah was great but b i was blown away by the distances that you did everything so okay day yeah. one, you do the you do the the 24 hours of paddling and yep. eight hours of running and then yep. what um after that we did uh what was really cool about this this race also was at each, we can't say junction between different events, you had to find treasure. So after that, we had to dive maybe 25, 35 feet down to get a nice little bullion to move forward. That turned into uh, a, a, a traditional stand-up paddleboard, right, an inflatable stand-up paddleboard, which that event was 12, 14 hours long, followed by a mountain bike leg that was 20-something, 8, 27, 28 hours long, Fall into another foot trek that was 15, 16 hours long. 
which fall into the Billy Billy that was 12 or 14 hours long. So like you said, nothing is short, but everything is exciting. It's long enough that you feel pressure and the fatigue and the suffering and the tiredness and all the things that make you not want to finish or that, that particular leg, but short enough that you want to go fast to get it done quickly. Right. A lot of team building there, a lot of like negotiation with self, mental, mental work, a lot of, for me, finding a better way to get it done quicker. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a super, super exciting kind of uh, super exciting race just to begin with. Yeah. So you did not mention what I thought, at least based on what I saw on the TV, what the hardest event was. Ugh. There's one that Wait. seemed like it was absolutely brutal. Well, what did you see? What did you see? What did you think? The swim up the river. Oh, up the freezing river. You In know, the freezing river. It was a freezing river. So here's the sad part of this journey. It's an adventure race. Good things happen. Bad things happen. Our team didn't get to that point because we had a massive bike crash. Our team tapped in, crashed his bike, got a concussion. So he didn't get that far in the race. So we didn't complete that race, but that's okay. Because our, what we set out to do was expand the idea of adventure racing for different types of people. We did that. We wanted to build team, uh, wanted to work on team building. Uh, that team, Team Onyx, started with five members, right? So four members of that race and our um, the girl that did our, our camp and stuff. Now we have 64 members on Team Onyx doing adventure races around the world. So pretty awesome there. So yes, you're right. That was super, super hard, but I didn't get to experience it. <laughs> probably a good thing. Yeah, probably a good thing. Yeah, it yeah. Was, now how it far did. was that? It was swimming up a river. It was swimming up a, up a river after a storm and I heard the water was absolutely frigid. Yeah, It was the breaker of many teams, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was the breaker of many teams. The Italian team suffered really badly in that, in that, uh, that leg, but yeah, it was super hard. So one of the things we talked about uh, the first time that we had you on the podcast was, and what became really evident was your desire to never, ever, no matter what, quit. Yeah, yeah. And you talked about the one time that you did quit and how it messed with your head still. And this, still does. <laughs> and, and it became really obvious in the, when you had to stop. Yeah. How much that bothered you. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, like I said, so that race, our team captain crashed the bike. And uh, what people don't know, just before that, uh, our team captain was also primary navigator, right? So it's map and compass navigation, no electronics. So he comes, he comes to me, he goes, hey, Chris, why don't you captain right now? I'll just be primary navigator. Literally just before the bike crash, right? So maybe 25 kilometers before the bike crash, I was taking over team captain. Super excited to do that for the team. It was awesome. Bike crash happened. Now I'm responsible for finding a way to keep the team moving forward after a horrific crash. Super challenging for me, just managing people, trying to be safe, trying to make the right decision, trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. Like all that was on, on my plate now. Just happened that by doing the right thing, we didn't get a chance to finish the race, but it was the right thing to do. So inside, I'm not finishing the race. So I'm feeling like I'm quitting the race. But in reality, sometimes you just don't get to finish races. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you just don't get to finish races. It was, it yeah. was, uh, you could see what from, I could see yeah. watching it, what was going on in your head. Just like yeah. said, we said we were doing this. No, we're not quitting no matter what. Yeah. You could see when you were resigned to the fact that, hey, you know what? If we don't quit, he yeah, make it exactly, exactly. Life over, life over finishing first and foremost, right? Like I said, super hard decision to make emotionally, physically. Like we were super strong, we were super strong, ready to race. Just had a night's sleep, super engaged, crushing the bike, ready for the next leg. Ah, just didn't, this wasn't the cards weren't in our favor that for that particular moment. But again, you can always rest on did you make the right decision? for the right reasons at the right time. Mm -hmm. And even though, yes, I was <laughs> visibly disappointed <laughs> and emotionally disappointed that we weren't moving forward, still the right decision to make, right? Still yeah. the right decision to make. So Cliff and I are still friends. We still do things. It's, it's nice, right? <laughs> so he's okay. He's okay. He's right? okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. He's like well, so much into this growing, just growing 
or expanding the knowledge of adventure racing. So yeah, he's doing, he's doing great. You know, he's actually a professional chef, which is crazy. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Good one too. Yeah. Wow. You would never yeah. know that from the, right? all the money caked all over him. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. That, that gets back to why you guys crashed because remember the, the tires were so full of mud. The t- tires were full of mud, just got new packs on and literally we had, had a couple hours sleep and we were flying. <laughs> this passing team is feeling super, super good. Like, you know, we struggled on some of the water events, but man, we could ride bikes, right? So we were like catching up, making places, making places. Road just goes downhill real fast, takes it too, too big of a turn, just mis, just misjudged the turn and off we went, you know? Bike gets smashed all over the place. Helmet fall, gets a big crack in it, help falls off his head, crazy eyes. You're like, ah, oh. so, so painful. So painful. <laughs> so did you stay there to the, to watch the finish or? Okay. Yeah, okay. we did. Yeah. Because, you know, these kind of races too, it's not just about how your team does in the event. It's a community, right? Like there's, I can't remember how many teams were in the race, maybe 50 teams. I can't really remember, but you know, people are finishing all the time. It's a community. People are still, wow, tough break for you, but we're still part of this whole thing, you know, making the, the sport really, really nice. Uh, putting on a good show for TV and everything. Like, it's just really, really nice to be part of just people who want to move forward and, and get past uh, adversity and just keep doing hard things. So, yeah, we stayed to the end, went on a couple more bike rides, just real small ones, and on a couple walks, you know, just kind of took it easy a little bit. Cliff had to spend two days in the hospital, you know, so it was just like a lot of things there. But, yeah, we're still there to support the race. So what is your interest, excitement? Why, why the heck do you do these? Why do you do an adventure race? I mean, it looked excruciating. It looked like a nightmare to be out there. There was nothing that looked fun at all about any of it, at least from the perspective of somebody watching it on TV. Why did yeah. you do- Yeah, there's a lot of suffering involved, but it just goes down to maybe drive a little bit like it, it after a while, it takes a little bit more to look inside to see what you're made of, right? I remember when I first was an athlete, I remember a 5K was a long a long distance, right? Now a 5K isn't a long distance. After the 5K, a 10K was a long distance. Half marathon, marathon, 100 miler. Okay, a three-day race is now exciting, right? So it kind of gets pushed out a little bit. And yes, you can go too far. You can go too far, but it's just the excitement of, of looking in and and, maybe talking to yourself or being having that mental toughness to keep moving forward when you really, really, everything is trying to tell you to, to stop, right? Like what's it take for you to keep moving forward? I have to move forward fast all the time, but keep moving forward what that takes. Um, And races like this also, I am a huge, huge proponent. And I just love these team sports where the suffering isn't just about you. Can you be a beacon? Can you inspire people? Can you mentor people? Can you galvanize your team to keep moving forward when all the things are going bad, nothing's going in your favor? I mean, are you that person that people can lean on? Are you that person that can find a better way to get something done? Are you that person people can count on to keep moving the team forward? I, I got the chills, like right now. I really do. Like that just jazzes me up so much to be part of that. Not just being a leader of that, but also being a good follower of that. You know, just being on the team is just super important to me. How do yeah. you do that? So I'm on your team. There's four, you know, four of us on the team, obviously, and all hell's breaking loose. What goes through your mind? Yep. How do you step up? Why do you step up? Well, the good thing about team is you don't have to be the only person that steps up, right? As the race goes on, you may have your high days, you may have your low days. So not only are you there to support your other teammates, well, they're there to support you as well. So understanding relationships, understanding communication, understand when somebody's crying and whining for no reason, or there's an actual reason why they're crying and whining, being able to support, being able to understand people, right? To find a better way just to make sense of their things, just to understand what they're actually, what their problems are and kind of work through that with them. is super liberating. It's super exciting for me. So I think it's just having the wherewithal to want to communicate, to want to keep that relationship for the right reasons and moving forward there. So it's good listening skills, good communication skills, sometimes not good listening skills, you know, like all the things inside there. It's like, we're just going to keep moving forward. Let's go. You know, I'm just, and, and being part, like actually being part of somebody's 
comeuppance, right? They're in a very, very low, their feet hurt, whatever's bothering them. Like, okay, you were in that, that, that dark, shallow part with them and you were able to give them, encourage them something that made them come out of that trough. And now the next day, they're hours later, they're feeling good. Whatever is bothering them is not happening. Like, wow, got to be a part of that with somebody. You know, you're talking about deepening relationships, talking about making connections with people. Yeah. Yeah. Listen first, talk later and just kind of, yeah. A lot of good lessons in there for us in the business world, it seems like. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we just think about just ourselves or we forget that the team is, is as important, if not more important than whatever you're trying to accomplish, right? Just having, having worth all to maybe put all of your jazz behind you and just say, what's important for this person? How can we make this person better so that we all can move forward, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next crazy ah. thing that I heard you were doing. You sent me this text or something that says, hey, I'm about to do this row across the Atlantic. Now- I think your response, Gary, was, did you journal today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, holy cow, you're going to do what? Like, you know, how, how do you, A, come up with this? Who do, Who thinks of these things? And yeah. then why the heck? I think I asked you, why are you doing this? Like, yeah, you love to row. And that your answer can hate rowing, man. It's the worst. <laughs> it's not even a sport. No, rowing is a challenge. Uh, so for me, I'm a storyteller. I like sharing stories. I found myself maybe a year or two years ago, three, four years ago, whatever it was, being in a place where I felt I was just regurgitating past experiences and past stories and nothing new to contribute. Had I not experienced in anything new in my recent time that's exciting, that's worth sharing, that's inspiring for people, am I talking the talk and walking the walk? Or am I just like sitting back in my rocking chair telling, oh, back when I was this, I was that. You know, like I just needed, I just wanted a test. I wanted to stay engaged, stay involved, keep myself. Like I tell people all the time, sometimes you got to choose hard things. You have to choose the wrench to do hard things. That makes everything else easier. But I found myself in a place where I really wasn't doing that, right? I was doing things, but I knew when I looked in the mirror, I wasn't doing the things that I should be doing to keep myself spirited, to keep myself inspired. So I was looking for a challenge that was going to scratch that itch, if you will. And you have to be careful what you put in the universe because it comes back at you 50-fold fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've been, so it sounds like what I'm hearing is you were feeding others because I've seen you at your you know, at the CrossFit, yeah. I know that you are constantly feeding other people. I mean, if you go yeah. into Chris's uh, Trident Athletics CrossFit, or no, it's called Trident Athletics now, Yeah, right? we just changed the name to Trident Athletics, still a CrossFit gym, but just changed the name to Trident Athletics. Trident it's a broader Athletics. market, yeah. <laughs> Chris, uh, you can't really tell it from just listening, but Chris has a very loud voice, <laughs> and... <laughs> There is nobody that doesn't know he's in the gym at that moment because you yeah. are encouraging and yelling and harassing everyone everywhere you go, right? That's yeah. just your thing. That's just, and that's my whisper voice. That's just who I am, right? <laughs> like, it's just the energy, man. It just comes, I love what I do. It just, it just comes through. It comes through in races. It comes through like, even now my voice is getting loud. I should turn my thing down, but it's just who I am and what I do. And I just, I not changing that. I just, I just love it, you know, but yeah, so just looking for stories, looking for experiences, just wanting to walk the walk and not just like, we give advice to people all the time. Like, do we listen to our own advice? Do we do the things we ask people to do? Well, I ask people to do hard things all the time. I'm like, well, then go do fucking something hard, son. Right. Yeah. And this was it. <laughs> Ooh, for sure. So, yeah. Um, what came through your mind when somebody asked you, well, how did it happen? How, how did it happen yeah. that this is what you guys chose to do? Yeah. So this was a third party experience. Our team captain, Brian Nicholson, and his buddy, James Hine, worked together. And they were slotted to do this race maybe five, six years ago, right? It's a very unheard of race. There's only been less than 1,200 people that ever do it. For some reason, that race didn't go, but it was on Brian's mind for a long time. So Brian was looking for people to make a team of four reached out to a friend of mine, Dan Cirillo, and said, hey, and I think I'm going to quote this. Do you know any idiot fools who would want to row the boat across the Atlantic Ocean? And the lady's like, do you know anybody that would even entertain this crazy thing? And of course, 
you know, Dan and I have a, have a good relationship. He's all like, I know the two perfect people. It was myself and Brian Shantosh. So, you know, it was cavalier. Wow. Brian called and said, hey, does it sound exciting to you? I'm like, heck yeah, it sounds exciting to me. No research, no nothing. Talk to uh, Tosh. He's like, well, if you do it, I'll do it. And we said yes. And that was like two and a half years ago. Wow. You're, I mean, I can't imagine. And you're not somebody that rose all the time, right? I am five foot, maybe nine, 165 pounds. I'm not even built for rowing, man. <laughs> you ever seen rowers? They're gigantic. They're six, seven, 240. They're huge. Yeah. So, yeah, this was totally not up my alley. And that was also really exciting for me. Also, Gary, if you ask me to ride a mountain bike, I've ridden mountain bike. I can go faster, slower. If you ask me to run, I can run faster, slower. I've run before. Paddle a kayak, canoe, done all those things before. I've never rode a boat. Definitely never rode a rowboat. And definitely never even had a boat in the ocean. So everything was new. Everything was exciting. Everything I had to learn. And that like jazzed me up. It fired me up so much. I'm like, holy cow, this is going to be awesome. You know? Yeah. So was it more excitement or more fear? Or was there any fear? In the beginning or post? Well, probably in the beginning and during. I mean, we yep. haven't even gotten to the during, but I know. <laughs> when you're... When you're thinking about doing, like if I was thinking about doing that right now, it would be petrifying to me thinking, I don't, just like what you said, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't even yeah. have a concept of what I just said yes to. Yeah, so I, felt the exact, I felt the, exactly the same way, but that was exciting for me. I'm like, holy cow, this is completely new. This is completely exciting. I'm capable of many of things. Well, let's see if I'm capable and can kind of do well in this event that I know nothing about. So, yeah, remember, this was like two and a half years ago when our training first started. When our okay. training first started, I don't know if you remember or not, but remember I broke my neck? Oh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I had to get four new vertebrae in my neck. Yep. So I didn't get a chance to train for six months, then started training again, like at the two-year mark, you know, concept two, weightlifting, all that kind of stuff. Got a coach, our team got a coach to kind of, help guide us through this experience of what we're supposed to, you know, be looking for late, later on. So it was nerve wracking and you know me very well. And I'm an excitable guy I like variety. Well, rowing is not variety. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's mundane get, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. So now let's go to race day. So you, well, you trained, race I remember, day. I remember I sent you a text, I don't know, let's just say six months ago. And I said, uh, Something like, you know, what are you up to this weekend? And you said, oh, I'm going to just do a little trial run or something for trial row. And yeah. I, and I said, what does that mean? And you said, I'm going to go out and row for 12 hours or something like that. Yeah. 12 hours? Who <laughs> yeah. rows for 12 hours? Yeah, we did so some 72 row. hour rows in a garage. We've yeah. done some, yeah, just a lot of rowing. Yeah, we rowed from like Florida to Georgia. Uh, a lot of rowing. So we trained in Florida. So did a lot of rowing, like a lot of rowing. But all the one that we did didn't even compare to what we experienced on the ocean. Okay, you know? let's go yeah. there. So let's take yeah. us through the start of the race. What was the start like? How many boats were there? What was going on? And what was going on through your head? Yep. So 42 boats, I believe, in this race uh, comes in different uh, classes. You have single people doing the whole 3,000 miles by themselves who are still out there rowing. Wow. Right now. Right now, they're they to finish in like three and a half months. So they got a ways wow. to go still. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> no, thanks. I know. Even I'm saying no thanks to that. So you got singles, doubles, trips, fours, and fives. Right? We were a four-person boat. All the boats are lined up. Um, the Atlanta Campaigns runs the race. They do a really, really good job of making it seamless from showing up in Spain to getting your boat prepped up to starting the row, right? So all the boats have a two minute start separation. Um, our goal was to win, right? First place, first American team ever to win. Um, and that was our goal. So our team uh, manager is like, hey, we're going to start. We're going to do what's called three up, which is two hours of rowing, 40 minutes of rest, two hours of rowing. We're going to do that for three, four or five days, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so funny is when I say it, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> no, no. Listening to this, I'm thinking that who came up with that? And is that even possible? 
but yeah, it is possible. But yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, that worked out really, really well for uh, really, really well for us. We got out front quickly, maintained that first, second, third place for a long time. Got into first place. We we're like 12, 14 days into the race, right around Christmas time. We were like literally us in another boat, neck neck in the big ocean, you know, five, six hundred miles offshore, just actually racing, you know, <laughs> which is insane to think about. <laughs> yes. Well, hold on a second. Hold on, Chris. So if I'm listening to this right now, in my mind, I would be trying to picture what the heck does this boat look like? It's not like a little kayak. Uh, no. What, it, what does it look like? Yep. So it's uh 26, 27 feet, uh, has a small cabin on in the stern, right? About six feet long, maybe three and a half feet high. You can sit up in it. You can almost lay down flat in it. In the front of the boat, the bow of the boat, you have about a six and a half, seven foot cabin, about three and a half foot high. That you could almost lay down in. It's about five, four or five feet wide. In between those two, flat hull, three sliding seats, and six oars. That's it. There's some hole space to put food. There's a water maker on board, poop and piss in a bucket, uh, full ocean going electronics package. So full uh, electronic navigation, AIS, like all the things that actually real, real boats have. So all that was there as well. So, so it's three, small. It only had three seats. Yes. Yeah. Because only three, three people seats. are rowing? Well, typically, most people row two hours on, two hours off. All right, 24-7, two hours on, two hours off. That's the typical way most people are, are doing the race. So you get two hours of rest, of which you have to make food, cook food, eat food, clean your body, make sure your body is recuperating in that time, sleep, recover, get back on oar, right? Rinse, repeat, 33 days. <laughs> All night long, just rowing. All night long. Yep, just yeah. rowing. So what is the ocean like way out there in the middle of nowhere on a, on a little 26 foot boat? Well, first of all, you might have to bleep this out, <laughs> but mother nature does not give a fuck about you. <laughs> <laughs> she is going to do what she is going to do. <laughs> Regardless of what you think, she's going to do what she's going to do. She wants to bring a storm. You get a storm. Wants to rain. You rain. Wants hot sun, hot sun. You got you. There's nothing you can do about it. So you feel your place in the universe real quick. You feel your <laughs> sense of scale in the universe real quick. You are a very tiny boat in a gigantic ocean Ugh. where as far as you can see is as far as you can see. <laughs> there's like nothing in your way. Yeah. It's just you, your boat. You don't see any other boats in the race. It's very um, awe inspiring where you have the entire majesty of the sky where you see every star that you can see. There's nothing in your way. It's like wow. you can see through the galaxy. It's crazy, like absolutely wow. crazy. The nights are dark as dark. The days are hot. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the temperature like out there at night? It was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. We rode without shirts on at night, short pants. Um, it was just, it was nice. When we got closer to Antigua, got a little bit hotter, right? Uh, a lot of guys rode naked. Um, I wore some sleeves just to keep the sun off my skin during the daytime. Some guys had no shirts on, so the temperature couldn't be better. You are sequestered or succumb to their storms out there like all the time, right? It's mother nature. Yeah. High winds, big water, big seas, 30 foot swells, 35 knot winds. Like, wow. you're out there. Yeah, you're out there like a little cork in the big ocean, floating around, right? Going 3.5 to 4 knots. Yeah. So biggest challenge it's, you guys ran into was what? We had a myriad of challenges. Uh, we had some boat mechanical issues, which other boats didn't get to experience that. Like, what do you mean? A mechanic? It uh, doesn't seem like yep. there would be mechanical issues. Well, they're solar-powered boats, right? So the boats have two lithium batteries run by solar power that allows us to run all of our electronics and run all of our, our water maker, right? So the water desalinators on board. So we make our we make our water that we use to make our food. Um, and then all the electronic package is run off solar power. For some reason, uh, we lost our batteries. Our solar power wasn't working. So we didn't have, the boats are auto-steered. So it's a GPS rudder. Um, but without power, you don't have a GPS rudder. So you have to like what we call hand steer. So you have to like hand move your rudder with some lines, which is super challenging. 
Um, so that kind of hung us up a little bit. Uh, that's not true. It hung us up a lot, not just physically, but also kind of emotionally, right? You're in first place. All of a sudden your boat shits the bed. Now boats are starting to pass you and you're trying to rectify or problem solve. Our team did a fantastic job of navigating the six or seven relatively major problem sets that we had on the boat, mechanically fixing things, just managing things. We did a fantastic job with that. Um, How'd yeah, you just, uh, Wait, well, we have, yeah. well, how did you <laughs> how, how did you keep going with no water? Oh, so we have, we, every boat has 15 days of emergency water and 50 days oh. worth of, of food. So we were allowed to drink some emergency water. Um, one of our solar panels came back up. So we we're able to make uh, 20 liters or whatever for our, for the team during the day. So we just had to ration stuff a little bit, um, which is cool. You know, the boat still got a rope, boat, boat still has to get to Antigua. Um, you just make different decisions, right? If your car's got one wheel flat, well, don't drive so fast, right? So you still have to get to where you're trying to go, manage that emotionally, manage that mentally, manage that physically, um, just keep moving in the right direction. You know, I kept having this saying in my head, one more stroke closer to Antigua. One more stroke closer to Antigua, right? Like something you just can't, can't control. Mother Nature, you can't control, right? Mm -hmm. You can give the same amount of effort every single stroke. For two hours, you're going four knots. And for the next two hours, you're going 1.2 knots. Same exact effort. So, so yeah, so you have to manage a lot of emotional management, a lot of physical management. It's, it's a lot. It's a long race. <laughs> so yeah. now you're, uh, how many total miles was it? Uh, 3,000 miles. Just that we did 2,970 something miles. Okay. So 3,000 yeah. miles. You're now a yeah. thousand miles in. <laughs> I know there's a point you're like, I am 1500 miles from the nearest land <laughs> and there's a bird. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, what the heck goes through your mind? 1500 miles in and you got 1500 more miles to go. Keith's I mean, choking. Yeah, did yeah. you ever want to quit? No, no, 100% emphatically never wanted to quit. I can honestly say too that I'm not trying to be egotistical or braggadocious or whatever. Like there really wasn't a time where I actually didn't want to get to row. Like rowing was way more manageable than the two hours off. Two hours off, you have to manage so many things, right? You have to manage your emotion, your sleep, your food, your body, like all these things you had to do. And it's a very short time. When you're rowing, like all you had to do was row mm. and there's not much else you can do. Just row. So <laughs> I made a goal of mine. And a lot, every, every guy on our team is like, Hey, so basically you're rotating every hour with a partner. And you're like, my partner's not going to row one of my minutes, not one. I'm going to do my 120. They're going to do your 120. So for a team, we did really, really well with that. Just making sure that everybody's like participating as much as they could. Um, and that was just, it was awesome. You know, I took rowing serious and I took resting serious. So. Yeah, that was my little idea. And what was your, um, were you wearing gloves or no gloves? Or how did, what were your hands like during all this? Like what broke down the, what was the part of your body that broke down the most during this event? Yeah, so uh, me included, but most people have three contact points that just wear out. The first one would be your butt. Because you're sitting on a seat no less than 12 hours a day. Oof. Sitting on the same two sits bones, the skin starts to chafe because you're wet like most of the race, right? Either with sweat, salt water. So your skin is just sloughing and eroding off. It's fucking miserable, right? <laughs> so that part, and you're sitting on the same spots over and over and over and over again for two hour blocks. Even when you get off the seat, right? You get off the row seat, you go back to your uh, cabin, which is literally half a step away and you're sitting again. So you're sitting for 23 hours, 24 hours a day. So your butt takes massive trauma mm -hmm. uh secondarily and surprisingly your feet i don't know if you've been on a concept two rower where the strap comes across your feet yeah you know your hands are kind of used to working and being tough but your shoe your feet are always in shoes and it's relatively soft well that strap creates a lot of blisters on the top of your feet unexpectedly that kind of triggered my brain a little bit i was like oh i didn't expect that to happen <laughs> and then the third thing would be hands and hands most people um either Gloves, grips, or barehanded. Barehanded is probably the best choice. Since your hands are in the same position, they blister. The blisters dry out, create callus. Your hands are good to go. And that takes about two weeks, maybe two, 10, 15 days, two weeks. Wow. Yeah. 
right so, now my wife is like do something with your hands because they are like 60 grit sandpaper <laughs> <laughs> don't touch me <laughs> So you rode straight for 33 days? Yeah, 33 days. Yeah, 33, 33, 18. And that beat the record by quite a bit. By the American record by 14 days, right? I was just doing a little research just the other day. Um, obviously, we wanted, we wanted to hit first place. We didn't, that didn't happen. We took fifth place in the four-man boats and sixth place in the overall race, right? Emotionally, you want to row hard and you want to hit first place and we've, that was what we're telling our sponsors and everybody. Hey, man, sometimes that doesn't happen. So, you know, when you're racing things, just sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. Uh, and it was kind of emotional that we didn't kind of do that. But I was kind of, people were kept telling me like, hey, don't let not being in first, second, or third place erode from the overall accomplishment. So I've been really trying to come to grips with, to wrestle with, not hitting podium but still what a magnificent accomplishment. So on the Talisker Whiskey site, they have every race, every race, every racer since 2015. So I put our score in there, our time in there. And before this year, only ooh, seven or eight boats were ever faster than us. Wow. Since 2015. This year was a fast year. So they were obviously four or five boats faster than us, but still that's a huge accomplishment, right? The last American boat that finished was 14 days longer than us. So That's believable. Can you imagine yeah. 14 more days than what you did? Let me tell you something, Gary. There are still people rowing. Oh my God. There are still people rowing. Like I wake up every morning just looking at the app that shows people. I'm like, they're still rowing. How freaking awesome is that? I'd be bonkers by this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd be bonkers. But the mindset, we talk about kind of mindset and different ways to attack the problem. We wanted to race fast. So we didn't take some things. We tried to stay hard and committed to our goal. So our experience was different. I'm imagining than someone that knows they're going to take two and a half months to finish the race. They're just attacking the beast, right? They're attacking the race differently. Maybe not rowing as hard, maybe not rowing as much, maybe taking more sleep, maybe eating better, like all the different ways that you can tackle a race. So even though I'm, I'm like, oh, there's no way I want to still be rowing. But, you know, if that's what you set out for, it's probably an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Sunsets, sunrises, moonrises, just all the different things that Mother Nature throws at you. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It's so inspiring. You feel, you feel your place in the universe. Like, you feel the sense of time and your space in the universe. And that's it's a gift I want to say thank you for because, wow, before that I was just racing through life, not really aware or paying attention now i'm like you know what i'm just gonna be me right now yeah super Love interesting it. for me yeah well was the hardest part of the race mental or physical the hardest part of the race was mental yes because the physical became routine i just got a row Intensity of rowing, how hard I row or how hard I don't row is modular, right? It modulates a little bit, but you're still just rowing. The mental thing of, holy shit, 14-hour nights, I got to do it again. Oh, I got to eat this food. Ugh. Oh, I got to make sure I drink water. Oh, my butt hurts. This hurts. Like all the things that get in the way of people accomplishing goals, they're there and they don't go away. They're coming back every two hours. Just slamming you in the face. Oh, my butt hurts. Oh, this hurts. Oh, my, uh, whatever kind of things is bothering you. They don't go away and they don't get any better. <laughs> you just got to create a different relationship with them, right? Yeah. So take us to the finish line now. You're, oh. you know, you're half a mile from the finish line. And what was that? Or what was it like to AC land? Yeah. Then get to the finish line. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about scale for a second. What was it like to finish to sea land? Well, you can sea land about a day before you hit land. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you can sea land about a day before you hit land. <laughs> so for this race, every what I love about what Atlantic Campaigns does, they celebrate every single finish. Like it's, it's an awesome finish. 
So you're in contact with the race coordinators. You're like, hey, I'm eight hours away, whatever it is. They're like, all right, here's your last bearing. Take this direction. You're rowing, you're rowing, you're rowing, you're rowing, rowing. And when you kind of get close, they send out a jet ski and a video boat. So every finish for this race is live on Facebook. So your last, whatever, 20, 30 minutes of crossing line is film. There's flares and all this chaos and boats are spinning around. And you're videoing. And what you don't realize is that you've been sitting down for 33 days and you haven't taken more than five steps a day. So they're like, stand up and put your flare up. You're like, I don't even have any legs. <laughs> so you're just wobbling all over the place. You know, so you finally finish the, you know, they, they get the photos and everything for you in the video. And, you know, you're they're like, all right, you got to get to the, to the, to the pier. It's a freaking another mile away. <laughs> so you get, you do the mile. Um, they pull you up to the, to the, uh, to the dock. The race coordinators are there and they're announcing your time and telling them about everybody and your family's there. My wife was there. My sister was there. Our other teammates, families was there. And it's big old, you haven't seen people in like 30 plus days. You've seen nothing or talked to nobody except for the other three yayas on the boat for 35 days, 33 days. So it's so overwhelming. And you're, you know, you're holding the American flag and you're like, I, you're on the boat still. So you've got your sea legs and stuff and they're giving you your plaques and you're filling all the photos and asking you questions. And then you take the first step off of a boat that you've been on for 33 days. You haven't stood up. You got no muscle. I've lost 17 pounds and the world is rocking. <laughs> like, you're talking about sea legs. Oh my God. Like you just, you can't, you can barely even stand up. You know, and everything's just wobbling around and people are trying to give you hugs and you're like, oh, it's so loud. It's, so, it's a lot. It's a lot. You're trying your best not to man cry, but you do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. And your wife, she loves you so much and she gives you a big hug. And she's like, you stink. <laughs> and she still gives you a kiss and hug and it's so amazing, you know. And then, you know, you've been talking about eating food, real food for weeks <laughs> and yeah. And you're getting, there's food and drinking beers and it just, it's, I really don't have the, even the, the words to really describe how surreal, like it's just so much and so surreal that it takes you days just to realize that when you wake up, you don't have to row. <laughs> Right, we rolling. Took, in your sleep? You're rolling your sleep. Were you can't you sleep for more than 15 minutes yeah. because when you're on the boat, you're like, "Oh, is it my turn to roll?" Like you're taking like 15, 20 minute naps just because you don't want to make your partner wait for you, right? So that doesn't go away like immediately. I didn't take a, I didn't stand up to take a pee or a poop for 33 days. I couldn't even stand up and pee. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get out of bed and wobble and hit the walls and try to get to the bathroom and sit down. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. It's so overwhelming. And I'll just share whatever. It's so overwhelming that, you know, three or four hours after you finish and all the stuff starts to settle down, we go back to our hotel or go back to the hotel. I'm taking my first shower in 33 days. Wow. Hot water hits me. I fucking break down, bro. Crying, sobbing, just like finally just so overwhelming that this journey is, that part of the journey is complete. Like literally just sobbed in the shower. Sobbed in the shower, the water hit me. I couldn't even stand up. I had to take a shower bath. I had to lay down in the, in the water just because, yeah, it was just, it's just overwhelming because your emotions are just all over on the boat, right? I mean, and you find like, oh my gosh, I'm done. Wow. Like I'm done. Happy or sad? I don't even know. Like, I don't even know if it was happy or sad. It was just such a release of something, like everything, right? Oh my God, I don't have to row. Holy cow, look what we just did. Could I have done better? Could I have done worse? Could I have like, you know, like all the things. Was I ever a dick? Was I an asshole? Was I awesome? Was I, was I lifting? Was I meaning was I all the things it just oh, just floods out of you 
right? I'm speaking for me. I don't know about my other teammates yet, but just floods out of you. And you're like, whoo, your tolerance for people is very short. Like everything is just so different. Time is just different. It's just different. Everybody, let's do this, let's do that. You're like, I really don't want to do anything, but I want to do everything. <laughs> yeah. Exhausting. I mean, you have no land muscles, like all your land muscles, your leg muscles, your arm muscles. I didn't push anything for a month and a half. You know, just everything was just wobbly. I'd walk five steps, like, ah, take a nap. <laughs> and yeah, just amazing. Right now, this was just what last week, right? Yeah, we finished on the when we finished the fifteenth, I think, something like that. We finished on the fifteenth. So when is that? Yeah, like two weeks ago. Yeah, this is two weeks ago. This isn't like yeah. two years ago that you have. And I was trying to get you on the podcast even sooner, I, and you were kind of I, avoiding me. Which I I'm, was, because I, I couldn't process. Like I've been, you know, what's crazy, Gary is. So it's been, we'll say what, 15, 12, 15 days. I really just stopped wobbling like five days ago. Wow. And like, there's so much that like you're one of a couple people's like, oh, let's get on the podcast. I'm like, I don't even know what I even say in the podcast. Cause I haven't even, I can't even process <laughs> enough yet. You know, it's like an integration, reintegration to the world about all the things. Yeah. So last week would have just been, we rode hard and we ate shitty food and we finished, you know, like there's just, it just hadn't come, hasn't, I'm still having trouble articulating, obviously, right? Like yeah. there's just so much to lessons learned. What could you do better? Would you do great? Like all the things, hey, you didn't hit podium, but you still did a fantastic race. Like all the emotions are, it's taking time to kind of to intellectually and emotionally bubble to the surface to share. Mm. Yeah, so it's been- <laughs> What was it like walking into your Trident Athletics uh, for the first time? Yeah. Uh, so I avoided it. So I secretly came home for two days, didn't tell anybody because it's just a lot. Just overwhelming support. The gym put up two rowers in the back of the gym where people rode for the whole month, which is awesome. Yeah, crazy. Don't even, we raised a lot of money for our cause, Big Fish Foundation. I actually, two-part story here. I had a bittersweet finish. I didn't share this, but I had a bittersweet finish because my dog died five hours after I, or maybe six hours after I got off the boat, You're right? Over. So, woo finished. Yep. I don't picture was diagnosed with DCM like six months ago. I've been gone for two months, you know, rowing. He's been taking care of my wife, just doing other things. I laid down that first night, tried to get some sleep, popped up. I had a freaking visceral conversation with my dog. Wobbled to the bathroom, sat down, peed, got up, hugged my wife, phone rang. Oh, your dog died. So kind of a bittersweet thing. But here's what's super crazy. Another teammate's dog died the day before the race. So it's just weird of how this was bracketed in with sorrow, emotion, elation, depression, excitement, like all the emotions. Like you put four Navy SEALs and Marine on a boat, what they can do well is freaking row hard. <laughs> Can you handle all this other shit that we're going to throw at you, right? You know, can, can you handle all this other stuff that Mother Nature is going to throw at you? So it's been more than just like a pad, a rowing race for, for me personally. It's been just like a journey of like all these different emotions, all this different. You're talking about coming back to the gym. Like there's so much support. And everybody's so excited. And it's just awesome. It's awesome. It's hard to receive everything at one time. So I've been kind of pittering in a little bit because... I want to show my appreciation for support as much as you're supporting me, mm. right? So I'm doing a little bits. So if one or two people come up, I'm like, wow, I want to let you know I'm gracious and I'm grateful for you. And I appreciate all the stuff that you've just helped with my family, me, a wife when I was gone, business, like all the things. I just want to show appreciation for that. So I'm taking it slow, still taking it slow. Wow. And I can do 10 push-ups right now in case you wondered. <laughs> well you're used to giving so much you're used to being such a giver and a encourager and then it's probably hard to accept it versus it is it is it is it's hard for me to like to just interest it's just so new it's like it's just so new like everybody is so excited and they see some things that i am learning to see now what a great adventure what a great accomplishment because half me is still like we didn't make podium right 
So they're help. I know, but they're helping me with that, which is really, really, really good. Which is like, man, I can't. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blessed man. You know, I'm so grateful. And on their side, they're thinking, or at least for me, I'm thinking, uh, not a chance in hell I will ever try <laughs> something like that. So I'm just happy to know somebody that did. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it ain't never gonna be me. And yeah. So thank it's crazy. You my doing. wife was uh my wife was doing a little research. She's like, hey, you know, there's a stat out there that says over 25,000 people have summited Mount Everest and less than 1,200 have done this race. Wow. I was like, whoa, that's pretty awesome. That's super you know? awesome. And yeah, I don't think so. I want to, if I know if I should ask you this question, but it's- Go like, ahead, man. Put it out there. You know me. I'm an open book. Well, it's what's next for you now. I mean, what can possibly yeah. stop that? I mean, and I, hope, I can't, have you even thought of that? <laughs> it's only been 15 days, so. Yeah. It's so interesting too, because, you know, my whole life I've had, I've always had something out there that I'm kind of struggling for or working for or some kind of goal out there, which is one of the reasons I chose this race because I was missing that for a little bit. I kind of, on the boat, me and my BFF promised each other we're never doing anything hard ever again. <laughs> <laughs> never doing anything hard. I'm never suffering again. I'm off the boat. I'm like, ah, I might have lied to him, you know, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't have a specific event in mind, but I know I just want to have fun during that event. I want to do it with people I care about. I want to have fun during that event. Right now I'm telling myself, I don't really care about how I finish or whatever. And I think that's the truth. I've already signed up for five or four, <laughs> four, five mile, like trail hikes in my local area here, just because I need to do something to kind of get my body strong again. So I'm going to walk those. I'm pretty excited about that. I've got a little small half marathon scheduled in end of March, which I'm going to walk that. I might run and walk that one. We'll see. <laughs> just to do it. Just uh, I just need something to kind of, for me, I, it's really hard for me to train with nothing at the end of it. It's really challenging. So I love training. So I just need something to kind of, oh, that's on the books. I'll just go and piddle through that, you know. Um, in my dark soul, my darkness, the angry Chris, the dark Chris, you were talking about quitting earlier. I don't know if you remember, but I didn't finish the Arrowhead 135s, 135 mile, middle of the winter sled pool. That's kind of on my mind. Don't know about that yet, but that's where I'm at. I'm not in a rush to, I'm not in a rush to do anything. I'm in a rush to like support my my family. I'm in a rush to be a better human. I'm in a rush just to have relationship with people. I'm in a rush just to like share experience. I mean, I'm in a rush to like mean my hugs, you know. I'm in a rush to say, God, thank you and mean it. You know, I'm in a rush to just stay in touch with my emotions. Last question. Like what, because I'm betting somebody, I'm guessing somebody listening is probably thinking this. What were you thinking? Like when you're doing all those, that rowing and it's got to have been monotonous. Are you guys talking? Are you quiet? And when you're quiet, what are you thinking about? Yeah. So like I said, our boat had a lot of uh, challenges. So maybe two and a half, <laughs> maybe two and a half, three weeks into the row, our two Bluetooth speakers that we brought, the salt water destroyed. So before we listened to music on the boat. So the last three weeks, no music. <laughs> so we had guys had ear, headphones, earbuds or whatever. I mean, you have music or you listen to a book, but it's so weird on the boat because it's not like this interaction or this, this collaboration anymore. Um, so sometimes you did that. Uh, while we had music, it was great. You'd sing, you'd stay in tune, you'd, you'd play, right? Once that was gone, just added another complex layer of like, ah, oh, fuck, this challenge is really not really about rowing a boat. It's <laughs> way more than this. Uh, just added that complexity, but also gave you a chance to get in touch with self also gave you a chance to be open with your teammates and talk about man shit, I guess. I don't know. Like it gave you an opportunity to really be a good listener. It gave you opportunity to encourage when people are down. It gave you opportunity to express your suffering and not be judged for it. Right. So it gave you all these different opportunities to that. We do it normally take in alpha males lives, right? Like yeah. you just don't take those opportunities. Like it gave you plenty of opportunity to express. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So, 
maybe this is the last question then, uh, since I th said that was going to be it, but I got one more that came up. But I, could well, just I just rode two hours on, two hours off for 33 days, so it doesn't end. It just keeps coming, baby. <laughs> What's the biggest thing you learned about yourself during that 33 days? That it's okay to be quiet. So, Which is hard for you. Why? Because I'm a better which, way. Which is I'm going to share you. it. I'm going to share it, right? Yeah. So our team name is Shut Up and Row. I'm a better way guy. I like to share my ideas. Uh, I stepped on the boat with the intention of doing more listening and contributing than like sharing my better way, right? We got a team captain. We got four strong alphas on the boat. Like, hey, you know what? You don't need another chef, but you needed somebody just to kind of be the yes man for a while. So I took that role on which was illuminating for me of how much more I heard. It was illuminating for me. I'm like, wow, I have so much to say right now, but I'm not. <laughs> and just see what happened. It was illuminating for, it was inspiration. It was exciting for me to go like, I would have done it so differently. <laughs> this problem happened. They fit, ah, man, I could have done it faster. I could have done it better. You know what I mean? Like, but not, and be okay with that. Right? So that was a really, really big takeaway for me like a, a big learning experience for me um, using that in the off world. Now the real world. Now I'm like, it's okay. Just to listen. I don't have to like always share my better way. I mean, it's still better. Let's not get crazy, but I don't always have to share it. <laughs> so, so if there's somebody listening to this and they're like, man, I would love to have Chris come and uh, talk at one of our events or so I'd, I'd love to uh, follow Chris or learn more about him or see what he's doing. Because I know you have a whole program on the mindset to try to. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and maybe just spend a second, you know, spend a couple of minutes, talk about the, what you teach in yeah. your Trident mindset, because you live it on top of just teaching it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. So the, the our program is called Trident Mindset. It's an online education program. Uh, that helps people develop mental toughness. Now, the rub is this. Most people think that mental toughness is just about being hard, physically hard, only doing hard things. And it's not. It's about being in choice. Because when you're in choice, that's when your happiness starts. So Trident Mindset is really a, an app that helps you discover how to be happier how to remove some anxiety, how to relieve stress a little bit, how to ask for the things that you want and need. So it empowers you, empowers your mental toughness that gives you an opportunity to be in choice for the things that make you happy. So people forget about that. So basically we have 12 tactics that um, as a lesson every single day on how to employ some of our tactics in your normal everyday life, not super rocket science -y, not fat or woo-woo-y, just some tactics that you may be able to apply in your life to relieve some stress, to reduce some anxiety, and to increase your happiness. Like that's what it's about. Um, like I said, you can reach me at C. Smith, pretty simple, at tridentmindset.com. I uh, answer every single email. Not timely, but I'll answer it. <laughs> and of course, so it's to your, say. <laughs> and what's your website? Yeah, so trydatmindset.com is the website for uh, uh, Trident Mindset, and it's the same for Instagram. Awesome. Yeah. Chris, I'm trying, to, say, I'm trying I, to simplify and keep things simple. I had like all these other things out there. I'm like, woo, we just got to bring it down to one thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had been looking forward to this, and I'm so yeah. glad to talk and catch up, and I'm sure we'll talk more as soon as uh, I hit the stop button. But yeah. <laughs> amazing stuff you're doing uh things that the rest of us wouldn't even consider so thanks for for pushing through and completing those and making it yeah back. yeah it feels good to be home and thank you thank you i really hope you enjoyed today's episode and that through today's guest you heard how important it is to know your why and how impactful it can be in your life and the lives of those around you be sure to head over to whyinstitute.com and discover your why today. Remember, the more you know about yourself, the more you'll know about others. I'm Dr. Gary Sanchez, and I'll see you on the next episode.